All right, YouTube. We've been talking about this situation where we've got a ball, a hoop, and a disc, and we're allowing them to roll without slipping down some hill. We're trying to solve for the acceleration of each of these objects at the bottom of the hill. Now we've done this using force and torque, which is the way you'd typically see this worked in a textbook, or the way most professors would explain this problem. But what I want to do is use energy to solve this problem. And the reason being is that when solving this problem using force, you have to look at absolutely every force and every factor and every concept at work in the whole problem all at once, and then just combine it in one slick little math trick. Energy allows us to break up all those concepts a little bit more, which means it's a bit easier to figure out when you're first going through trying to learn how to do this problem. So we're gonna start with the conservation of energy. See, each of these objects is gonna start at rest, which means the initial kinetic energy is zero. Now, all three of these objects are starting some distance, we're gonna say D, up this hill, which means they have some initial gravitational potential energy. We know gravitational potential energy is given by mgh, where h is the height. And if you look at this triangle, what you'll see is the height of the wedge or ramp is gonna be given by d sine theta. Now this next term is what we call the non-conservative work. Now that's typically the work by friction acting on these objects. And friction is in fact acting on these, these rolling objects as they go down the hill. If there was no friction, they wouldn't roll. They'd just slide like an ice cube down the hill. The catch is friction in this case does no non-conservative work. And to understand why that is, we actually need to take a closer look at the final kinetic energy of these objects once they get to the bottom of the hill. See, once these rolling objects get to the bottom of the hill, they're gonna have some kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy is given by 1 half mv squared plus 1 half i omega squared. Where this 1 half mv squared term is the linear or translational kinetic energy. And this term 1 half i omega squared is the rotational kinetic energy. See, it's this point right here that's key in understanding absolutely everything that's happening in this problem. You see, friction is in fact doing work on this rolling object as it goes down the hill. But unlike a block which is just sliding down the hill having gravitational potential turn into translational kinetic energy, friction is doing work to turn some of that translational kinetic energy into rotational kinetic energy, thus causing this object to roll rather than just slide like an ice cube down the hill. Or to put it a different way, because some of the translational kinetic energy is effectively going to be lost or converted through work by friction into rotational kinetic energy, these rolling objects aren't going to be going as fast when they get to the bottom of the hill. And that's why we see their accelerations are less than the acceleration of an object had it just slid down the hill. Now at the bottom of the hill, there's no gravitational potential left, so that's zero. So now all we need to do is simply relate these two terms to each other. But now we have an issue. Much like we ran into having to relate A, the linear acceleration, to alpha, the angular acceleration over here, we now have this V and omega hanging out in our solution, and we need to relate them to one another. Now, angular velocity, omega, is given by V, the translational or linear velocity, over R. So subbing this term in right here, we have this equation, which relates the velocity at the bottom of the hill to everything else going on in the problem. Now, depending on which object we're dealing with here, we're going to sub in different rotational moments of inertia for this term I here. So doing this for a sphere, we wind up with a bit of a cancel party. You'll notice there's a mass term in every term here, which means the mass of these objects is completely irrelevant. Additionally, the radius of these objects cancels out, and we're left with, for our sphere, just this two-fifths hanging out, telling us it's only the shape of the sphere that matters. Cleaning this up a bit, this equation, which gives us the velocity of each object, but not the acceleration. So we're gonna turn real quickly to the kinematics. 
So if we have an object start at rest, the final velocity is given by 2AD. That final velocity being this term right here. So subbing in this right here, you'll see D, the length of the hill, cancels out. And we're again left with the acceleration of this sphere down the hill. And by plugging in different rotational moments of inertia for these other two objects right here in this function, we can solve for the acceleration of the other objects as well. And because physics works, we find the calculated accelerations using energy are the same exact results we found using force and torque. So while mathematically the solution for solving for the acceleration of these three objects might be a bit longer than using force, I think it's a bit easier to do on your first time through or, or when you're first trying to tackle this problem because it doesn't require you to have a perfect and complete understanding of everything going on with this rolling object all at once. It allows you to sort of chunk your way through it. Additionally, this really helps us understand how linear and rotational quantities fit together a little bit more cleanly than they do over here using this force and torque method. So ultimately, this has been the sphere, hoop, and disc rolling down the hill. I hope you found this useful. And on that note, that's all for now.